In this video, I'm going to talk about the third degree price discrimination. The reason why I talk about third degree price discrimination before the second degree price discrimination is that the second degree price discrimination is, is, is a bit more complex. And so I wanted to go over a simpler case first. So again, I have two examples, one in which everything is discrete, exactly the same framework. There are five customers. These are their willingness to pay or a continuous case, uh, the demand curve. Here I have two different demand curves. I'll talk about it in a moment. Still, the cost of production is zero for simplicity and the customers are going to buy as long as their surpluses are non-negative. All right. So th th this assumption has nothing to do with the second or third degree price discrimination or the first. So that's the standard assumption we make in economic theory. So here in the second degree price, oh, I'm sorry, the third degree price discrimination, the key is the following. The monopolist now cannot distinguish A, B, C, D, and E. I mean, I don't know my customers. I mean, I, I mean, okay, she's customer A. I can see her ID, but I don't know her willingness to pay. The only thing the monopolist knows, two things. One, you know, there is a customer whose willingness to pay is dollar. There is another customer whose willingness to pay is two dollars, three dollars, four and five dollars. That's all the monopolist knows. Sec but, but is it A or B or E? Doesn't know. The second thing the monopolist knows is that, well, as, as, as the seller, however, I can kind of classify my customers. And I know that some customers are having higher willingness to pay than the other customers as a group. How so? So let's suppose in this model, in the simple model, customer D and E and A, B and C are in the two separate groups. Customer A, B, and C are students, all right? And these are professionals, non-students, all right? I mean, I don't know if A is a, is a student, but I can ask for a student ID. And if A brings me the student ID, I'm going to say, oh, you're a student. What I know is that the students have lower willingness to pay, and the non-students have higher willingness to pay. That's what I know as the monopolist. So the question is, given that I have two different groups, uh, should I charge exactly the same price, the uniform price, or should I actually price discriminate them as different groups pay different prices? Well, I should charge different prices for different groups. In the continuous problem, I make the problem in the following way. So again, I have customers, I'm sorry, students, and their demand curve is given by this, and the non-students or professionals, and their demand curve is given by this. Oh, by the way, the other way around, this is non-student, this is student, because this demand curve is lower than this demand curve, because this is two times this. So this plus this so the first demand curve plus the second demand curve adds up to my original demand curve, A minus BQ. I just group them, right? I know, I know that there are two groups with different demands. One is higher than the other, all right? More willing to pay. So if this is the case, how do I... Uh, uh, determine how the monopolist determines the price. Well, simple. First of all, though, let's calculate monopoly uniform price. All right? I mean, you're a monopolist, okay? And you don't want to price discriminate. You just want to set the same price, all right? What would be your optimal price? Let's call it PM. And how much profit would you make? And then later, I am going to ask, can you achieve higher profit by discriminating the students and non-students? All right. So if you are a monopolist, 
what would be your price? So I'm going to solve the discrete case first and then the continuous case, all right? Well, if you're a monopolist, um, well, here we don't have a profit function to differentiate, right? Well, um, this is the problem with the discrete cases. So you can't really differentiate anything. So, however, you can just use, you know, a simple, uh, you know, algebra. I mean, um, uh, 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 accounting principles. If the price, a dollar, well, there is no point of charging a uh, less than a dollar, right? Because if you charge, for example, 80 cents, all those five customers are willing to buy, but you're charging 80 cents. If you charge one dollar, still all five customers are willing to buy. So you're going to make clearly more profit. And by the way, if it is a dollar, this customer's surplus is zero. Is she going to buy it? This is the assumption. The customers will buy as long as their surplus is zero or positive. All right. So if the surplus is zero, the customer will actually buy the good. So therefore, if the price is a dollar, oops, five customers will buy it. So the profit is going to be five times dollar. So it's five dollars. OK, so if the price is, well, there's no point of charging a price, for example, dollar sixty. Because at a dollar sixty, I mean, as long as it's higher than dollar, customer A is off the picture. She's not willing to pay for this. So only B, C, D and E will buy the good. All right. But if you charge two dollars instead, you know, higher price, you still have the quantity demand for. So therefore you should charge two. All right. Oops. Not less than two and more than one. Charge exactly two. Because once again, the customers will buy as long as their surpluses are non-negative. So if the price is two dollars, four people are willing to pay. So it's four times two, eight dollars is your profit. If the price is three dollars, once again, there's no point of charging price between two and three. If the price is three dollars, three people are willing to buy. So your profit is nine dollars. So it's increasing. Very good. If the price is four dollars, well, only two customers are willing to pay for it. And so profit is going to be two times four, which is eight. Huh? It started declining. And so you know what? You found the optimal uh, price. It's three dollars. And if the price is five dollars, only one customer is willing to buy and the profit will be only five dollars. So you know what? The profit maximizing price is three dollars. And how many people will buy it? C, D and E. So the quantity will be three. And the profit of the monopolist is going to be nine dollars or just nine. All right. Good. The question is, can you achieve more than that if you price discriminate? The answer is yes, you can. How? So let's determine student price and non-student price. OK, so if the student price, let's call it PS, it can be, well, first of all, the student price is not going to be $4 or $5, right? Because these are non-students. Students cannot pay a price higher than $3. So the student price should be lower than three. Student for non-students, price for, <clears throat> price for non-students should be higher than three, right? Well, first thing first. Well, if the student price is one, again, charging price less than one has no point. So at least charge a dollar. Your profit from the students is going to be three because one, two, three students are going to buy it. Well, you're going to say, well, what about D and E? They're also willing to pay dollar. Yes, but they don't have student ID. Remember, so they're not students. They don't have student ID. So when they come to my store, I'm the seller. I'm going to give them the product and ask, they're going to ask me the price. I'm going to say, well, if you have an ID, it's dollar. If it is not, well, whatever. All right. So for that reason, only three people will buy it. So I'm going to raise three dollars of profit from the students. If the price for a uh, seller is two dollars. All right. Well, 
two students are able to buy it. And then what happens is that my profit is going to be two times two, four dollars. And if the price is three, my profit from the students is going to be um, three because only co uh, consumer uh, student C is willing to pay that much. So my profit from the students is maximized if I charge two dollars for students. All right, what about non-students? If the, let's call it PN, the non-students price. Well, if it is, again, it has to be more than three, right? I mean, if it is three, okay, good thing. Oh yeah, well, it's good thing. If it is $3 or less, well, both D and E are willing to pay. C will definitely not buy it because C is gonna go for a lower price, all right? So therefore, D and E, are, two people will buy it at a price $3, but you can charge $4 and these two customers are still willing to pay for it. So you should start from at least $4, all right? So let's say you charge $4. What's the profit you're gonna get? There's no cost, right? So your revenue is your profit. Your profit is gonna be two times four, $8. It's two people can buy it. And then if the price is $5, again, no point of charging 4.3, for example. So your profit will be five. So the profit maximizing uh, price is this. Conclusion. Well, in this case, there's gonna be two prices. Students will pay $2. Non-students will pay $4. And the total profit is under price discrimination, let's call it pi D. It's gonna be students, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the profits from the students plus profit from the non-students. So it's four plus eight, 12, which is higher than your profit you can raise by charging uniform prices. So if you do not price discriminate, you are gonna make lower profit as a monopolist. If you charge, if you price discriminate as students, non-students, you are gonna raise higher profits, okay? So you should price discriminate. That's the, that's the conclusion. And this should be the pricing. Well, few discussions. Um, can we have three different prices? No, because we have only two groups in this model, right? Students, non-students. I mean, who is the third price for? I mean, who's gonna pay it? You know, each group has only one and only one price because there's only one good, right? So the number of prices depends on the number of groups you have. You can, I don't know, for, by the way, what happens here, because the price is $2, this guy, uh, the, the student can't buy it, he's not gonna buy it. So if you can regroup the students as, I don't know, for example, domestic students, international students, or poor students, rich students, but the point is how are you gonna verify poor student, rich student? You see what I mean? So verification is, is getting important, but for some reason, if you can separate a from the other two, well then you could actually make three different prices and that would increase your profit even more, right? But in this given specific example, that's the best you can do, all right? So here, do I have time? All right. So what happens to the surpluses and the deadweight losses, all right? So if you remember the total surplus in this problem, um, is, is 15. This is the highest monopoly can get. This is the size of the cake. What happens here is the monopolist uh, producer surplus is nine, which is exactly equal to the profit. How do I know that? Well, it's $3, the price. Remember, the producer surplus is just the price because the cost is zero. So at the price in the, in the uniform pricing, customers C, D, and E will buy the product. 
So the producer is going to drive producer surplus only from these three customers. So each customer is paying the same price, uniform, remember, three each. So three times three, nine. This is the producer surplus. What about the consumer surplus under uniform pricing? Customer A, she can't afford it. Man, she, can't, she doesn't buy it. Customer, because $3 is higher than her willingness to pay. Customer B, she's not buying it. Customer C, she's buying it. Her surplus is zero though. Customer D, she's buying. Her surplus is four minus three, one. And customer E, she's buying. Her surplus is five minus three, which is two. So three is the consumer surplus. The total surplus under uniform pricing, so let's call it UU, it's 12th, which is lower than the total surplus. Hence, the dead weight loss under uniform pricing, I mean under the standard monopoly, is only 15 minus 12, 3 units. Now we have to have a lower dead weight loss here. Let's, let's check. What is the producer surplus here? It's the total profits, which is 12. Why? Well, because the price for students is going to be 2. So these two guys will buy it. So the monopolist is going to get 2 price for 2 customers, 4. And the price for D and E is 4. Both of them will buy it. So 4 times 2, 8 plus 4, 12 is the producer surplus. Consumer surplus. Consumer A, she's not buying. Consumer B is buying, but her surplus is zero because she's paying two. Customer C is buying. She's paying two dollars. Her surplus is one. Okay, so one plus. Customer D is buying, but she's paying four dollars and her surplus is zero. Customer E is buying and paying four dollars and her surplus is 1. So the customer surplus is 2, total surplus is 14, hence dead weight loss. The total surplus under um, uh, uh, discrimination, let's call it DDD. So dead weight loss under discrimination is 15, which is the total surplus, minus 14, which is the uh, total surplus under price discrimination, so it's 1. So that's the dead weight loss if there is price discrimination and that's the dead weight loss if there is no price discrimination but uniform so therefore price discrimination is more efficient i'm going to continue uh, with this continuous example in the next video okay